Scott Mouse is going to speak to us today. He's a, he's, a, he's a speaker, he's a motivator, he's an organizer. He used to work at PNG here in our city, and now he goes around and helps people organize and become the best version of themselves. Let's welcome Scott Mouse. <laughs> Thank you. Very much. Uh-huh. How's everybody doing? Turn to the person in your right and say, This is a great day to be alive. Go ahead. <laughs> That's all I've got. Thank you very much, folks. When Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman was still getting his graduate degree at Princeton University, he was asked to oversee a group of engineers who were in turn asked to perform a series of mathematical calculations. Now, the math was not that difficult if you were an engineer, and yet the work proceeded at an excruciatingly slow pace and was absolutely riddled with errors. It was driving Feynman nuts, day upon day of error after error. So he decided he would investigate. And when he did investigate, he found that in truth, the problem was not the math. The problem was that the engineers were completely and utterly disengaged in what they were doing. It was at that point in time that Feynman decided that he would let the engineers in on what he already knew, which was why they were performing the calculations in the first place and why they were doing so while sweating their tails off in a poorly air-conditioned building in the middle of the New Mexico desert, Los Alamos, New Mexico, to be precise. At that point in time, his boss, Robert Oppenheimer, entered the picture and famously decided to pierce the veil of secrecy that had surrounded the project up to that point to let the engineers know that, in fact, they were performing a series of computations for an inconsequential lab exercise. They were performing a series of math calculations that would allow the United States to complete the race to finish the atomic bomb before the enemy did. Their work would win the war. From that point, the work, the workplace, the workers themselves were utterly transformed. They worked 10 times faster than they did before, and for almost three months, Not a single mathematical calculation error was made. They worked with intense passion, with intense pride. What was going on in those desert all those years ago? I will answer that question. We will come back to it. We will come back to it, but first we have to answer a more fundamental question. What motivates us at the core? What sustains that motivation over time? Because the answer to that question will unlock how to build the most powerful cultures from the ground up for startups or for any business for that matter. Now, I would posit to you that most of us, and I respectfully submit this, most of us don't actually know the answer to this question. It's just, it's just true. Why do I say that? Because of the intersection of two things. Number one, I have been very blessed to run some of the very largest businesses at Procter & Gamble, multi-dollar, billion-dollar businesses, including their very largest business, a $3 billion business, and along the way, I've been lucky enough to transform organizational health scores along the way, so I know a little bit about this topic. Much more importantly, the data doesn't lie. Gallup issues a poll about every three years that comes out to anybody that will listen, and in this poll, they profess and tell the world, you ready for this one? 70% of the workforce can be coded as disengaged. 70%. Amongst that 70%, 20% are actively disengaged. 70%. That means that right now, in this room, 7 out of 10 of you are actually playing Pokemon Go or Candy Crush on your cell phone instead of listening to me. That's fine. I can deal with that. I'm a big boy. 70%. That could be the only thing that can explain that kind of disengagement, this quality workmanship here. What is going on? We're not (laughs) evil as managers. We're not evil as managers. We mean well. We do, but we're tired and we're misinformed. If I were to poll this room, if I were to poll the country, and I have, and if I were to ask them, dear leaders, what do you think sustains motivation over the long haul? Invariably, one of three answers will will come up. People believe that sustained motivation comes from perks, pay, or promotions. Please allow me to summarily dismiss each one of these. Perks. Here's the problem with perks. They soon become expectations. At that point in time, they have much more power to actually demotivate rather than to actually motivate. This is an actual screenshot from an actual company. I don't know what to tell you about our happy-go-lucky ping-ponger there. 
He seems to have a pretty easy time with his job. In fact, the only guy that I know who has an easier time with his job than this guy would be this guy here, uh, our friend Mr. Bolt, who runs faster than your internet connection. But I digress. The point is, it's not perks. Perks is not what motivates us nor is it promotions. Here's the problem with promotions. One of two things will happen. Either number one, the temporary high that you feel from that promotion will soon be replaced by a more demanding and draining new norm, or what social scientists call the promotion paradox kicks in, whereby our hapless promotee, believing that the promotion will bring them closer to that which makes them happy, discovers that in truth, the promotion brings them farther away from that which bring, makes them happy, thus they begin to look for happiness offsets in their life. This is the truth, whether it's your first promotion or your fifth promotion. Promotions are not what sustain our motivation over the long haul either. So you say, well, clearly it must be pay. If it was pay, then this man would not have done what he did very publicly almost two years ago now. This is Dan Price, CEO of Gravity Payment Systems. It's a credit card processing company out of Seattle. He decided very publicly as the CEO, he was gonna take his million dollar salary, reduce it down to $70,000, and along with some personal wealth, redistribute all of that back to the employees, such that overnight, the minimum salary was $70,000. And in 40% of the cases, that meant that amongst the employees, they more than doubled their salary overnight. Now, why would he do that? Besides the fact that he's a really cool dude and he's got like a Brad Pitt thing going on there. Why would he do that? Because he came across the same study from Stanford University that I came across, which showed this. The motivational apex of money peaks at $70,000. Now, I'm not telling you it can't continue to sustain motivation past 70. Look at that peak. All I'm telling you is it reaches a point of diminishing returns. It begins to decline rapidly after $70,000. Price figured, well, well, why don't I just cut to the chase? We'll give everybody $70,000, we'll glean what we can out of money for a mo from a motivational perspective, and we'll move on to other interesting pursuits. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Scott, I'll tell you what. Why don't you give me $70,000 right now, and I'll show you how motivated I could be with that extra money. And I get it. I get it, but the truth is that motivation would not sustain over time. And in fact, two studies have helped reinforce this that that will not sustain over time. In truth, one study just came back, and I will grant you this, for sure, for sure, money has the power to demotivate. God forbid if you should find out someone at your level in your job who has roughly the same skill set, performing at the same level, is making more than you. I guarantee it can demotivate you. Or in the absolute, if you feel like you're getting paid not fair relative to your contributions, that could demotivate. But in terms of money as a motivator over the long haul, I assure you, it will not sustain motivation. Two major studies just came back to help me out with this. Pretty powerful studies. One showed that, first of all, if you were making $30,000 a year or $3 million a year, it didn't really matter. You were equally likely to be unhappy whether you made $30,000 or $3 million. That's what we're talking about here with motivation. It doesn't sustain over the long haul, even though we want it to. If it did, a series of studies called the Mega Lottery Studies, the second study I was mentioning, wouldn't have showed what they did, which is that the vast majority of Mega Lottery winners, like 95% of them, like this guy here, who can now afford to date a Kardashian, 95% of them choose to keep working even after they strike pay dirt. It turns out that the pursuit of something at work is a powerful draw, even more powerful than the draw of a lotto ball. But what is it? If it's not perks, if it's not pay, if it's not promotions, then what is it? There's a fourth dark horse candidate, a fourth candidate that often comes up when uh, managers are asked about what do you believe sustains motivation over the long haul? And that is the BHAG, the big, hairy, audacious goal. Now, to the extent that goals have intrinsic value, I can tell you that Yes, it can help a little bit, but it will not sustain motivation over the long haul either. In fact, I think Professor Christopher Bartlett from Harvard University had it exactly right when he said the following. People don't come to work to be number one or to get a 20% return on assets. They come to get meaning from their lives. Meaning. That's what drove those engineers all those years ago in the New Mexico desert. That's what drives all of us at the most fundamental core level, and in truth, 
70% of us are on a greater search for meaning at work than we even are in life. A number that will only increase with the influx of millennials into our workforce, which as of 2017 are now the majority of the workforce. So what do I mean by meaning anyways, this, this mystical, magical power? Meaning, at least within this sense of work, is giving work a greater sense of personal significance, thus making work matter. And here's the key. When you can give your work a greater sense of significance, it changes your relationship with your job. And that can change everything. And here's the good news. I've been studying meaning for over two decades now, gone through every study there is to go, uh, to, to go through on meaning. And I can tell you there are seven markers of meaning. These are conditions that you can foster as leaders, as employees, as coworkers to create meaning in and at work, to create meaning in the work you do and at the place you do that work. I have time to touch on three of them, so I'm gonna do that right now. The very first marker of meaning, these are conditions you can foster to create meaning in and at work. The very first one is doing work that matters. Work that matters to the startup, yes, work that matters to the business, work that matters to you, but work that matters to your employees. And here's the cool part. You really can reframe, reshape, and remold the work that you do, no matter what it is. One of the most powerful ways you can do that is something that Ocean is already onto. You can reframe your work through the lens of purpose. I was blessed enough to see some of the pictures you're gonna to see today ahead of time. You're in for a great show. And I was also very impressed with how hard Ocean, as Scott mentioned up front, is working with these people to articulate their purpose. So this isn't a new concept. But most people struggle with purpose feels like it's up here. How do I bring it down here so that I can use it every day at work? There's many ways to do it. One of the most powerful ways we can do it. Some of the most powerful purposes we can articulate, align with and support our non-negotiable values. The values that we hold most sacred. If you can pull out a piece of paper and write down your values, you're already well on your way to being able to identify what your purpose in work could be, what your profound why is. Why are you working so hard? For what point? To what end? To serve whom? And never underestimate the power of values and their impact in resonating and rippling and creating a powerful effect in our lives. I know you know that intuitively. I bet you're smart people. Let me give you some data. About 40 years ago, a study that took 40 years to complete was completed. The study was intended to show the incredible ripple effect that values can have on our life, especially the way we live and carry them throughout our work. The study was called the Edwards Duke study. Two people were in the study for two reasons. Number one, they had roughly the same number of descendants. And number two, they could not have been more polar opposite human beings. Jonathan Edwards was a pious man. He was a preacher. He was devout. He believed in good, hard work. Being a good human being, caring, all positive attributes, wrote books about it, being self-disciplined, virtue, a really good person. Max Jukes? Yeah, not so much. He's more like Justin Bieber, I, I don't know. In and out of jail his whole life. Sloth. He actually, you can't make this stuff up. He started something called the Freedom Movement, which was intended to say there are no rules. The only rule is every man and woman for himself. Do whatever you have to do. Did not hold down a job. Life of crime, not a good person. I wonder what happened to the descendancy of each of these people. Let's take a look. Our friend Jonathan Edwards, the pious man, his lineage produced ministers, war veterans, authors, professors, university presidents, congressmen, three governors, one who even went on to become president of the United States. I wonder what the descendancy of Max Jukes looked like based on his values and the way he showed up in his work. I wonder what his descendancy looked like. Looked like my family reunion is what it looked like. <laughs> The point is that never underestimate the impact that how we live our values, the impact that can have on all of those around us. And that's why values are such a powerful way to give you a first clue in what that purpose in your work might be. That's the first marker of meaning, doing work that matters. The second marker of meaning, be as a leader, creating an environment where people can work with an enhanced sense of competency and self-esteem. 
people feel good about themselves around you at work. Incredibly important for a powerful culture and a culture of meaning. Now, unfortunately, I have some bad news for you. One of the largest studies ever conducted on college campuses was recently completed, and it showed that self-reported emotional well-being among college students is at an all-time record low. A direct side effect of the hits to the self-esteem kids are taking on college campuses and the pressures that they put themselves in today's world. Now you say, okay, I got it, Scott. But when they get into the work world, they'll figure it out. They'll grow up. Well, why then did a study show the following? Uh, between 25 and 60-year-old people across the United States that were office workers were polled to say, what percent of you have suffered a hit to your self-esteem in the last six months? where something at work happened that made you doubt yourself, even for a minute, take a step backwards in your self-confidence. What percentage of people, 25 to 60, do you think answered, yes, I've suffered from that? Throw out a number, anybody. That's pretty close. 93% of people said they've suffered in the adult workforce. Self-esteem hits in the last six months. Now, I don't stand up in front of any crowd as a speaker without having double and triple checked data. I had a hard time believing this. So I independently did a survey and confirmed it. We can also do a gut check right now. That means that in this room and out in the stratosphere of all the people that are watching, nine out of 10 of us, more than nine out of 10 of us in the last six months have suffered some kind of hit to our self-esteem. Actually, that feels right about right based on experience. And it shouldn't surprise us because of the confluence of things that are happening in our culture. One thing in particular is adding to the backdrop as millennials flow into, the, into our workforce. And that is the power or the disempowerment of social media. Raise your hands if you've been on Facebook in the last six months. Raise your hands. The vast majority of you. Now let me ask you folks a question. When was the last time you saw someone on Facebook say, I am a total loser. I would love to post a series of posts for you to show you what a loser I am. Here's a picture of my daughter, isn't she ugly? <laughs> Nobody does that. What do you get instead? Here's a picture of me. I just climbed Mount Kilimanjaro <laughs> in the dark. Here's a picture of my six-year-old daughter going to Mensa class. This is what we get. We compare everybody else's highlight reel to our blooper reel. And it's having a real impact. One of the cool things about my job as a professional speaker, an author, a researcher, a teacher at Indiana University, is that I'm a research nerd. And I get a chance to really get involved in research and sometimes see studies even before they're published. There's a lot of work that's about to break going on right now on the impact of social media and self-esteem as a backdrop to that workforce that we're all a part of today. And a lot of work is going on, and I can break it down for you, the impact of you know, self-esteem on the x-axis, social media saturation on the y. There's a lot of parabolas involved and data clusters and little points of the, let me break it down and make it real simple for you here. You could read this one of two ways. Since the advent on the y-axis, since the advent of social media, since it became popular, self-reported social uh, self-awareness and self-esteem is going slowly down. You can also read that instead of over time, within a day. Social media saturation being within a day. The more time your day is saturated with social media, the more your self-esteem goes down. That is the backdrop we're working against here as millennials flow into the workforce. And that's just one factor that combines with the natural human tendencies of the human ego. It can have a very negative and odd effect. Let me show you what I mean. A series of studies was conducted called the Offset Studies by two social scientists at Florida State. They divided 2,000 office workers into two test cells. The first test cell, 1,000 people were placed in the negative feedback group. The other 1,000 the people were the control group. In the negative feedback group, it was arranged for those people to receive negative feedback on some aspect of their personality. The control group received no such negative feedback. The people in the negative feedback group came to view other unrelated aspects of their personality 10 times more positively than the control group. The groundbreaking study showed the extent that we will go to subconsciously as human beings to hammer out the dents in our armor when they're issued to us. 
We don't even realize we're doing it. So your boss tears you down and says, you have no strategic thinking, and he says it in front of a group. Off you go to convince yourself that I'm actually okay. I'm going to lick my wounds. I know I'm a good collaborator. I know I'm good at vision. I know I'm loyal. I know I'm a good person. We subconsciously spend all this energy pounding out the dents. And as a leader, would you rather have your people pounding those dents out or spending that energy in a much more productive pursuit. And here's the epiphany to this point. We have the opportunity as leaders to plant seeds of growth or seeds of doubt. I think you know which one I'm begging you to consider. I'm asking you to be intentional. I'm not telling you to mollycoddle employees and fellow coworkers. I'm not saying you can't give them productive, positive feedback. And in fact, I'm gonna give you access to my toolkit where, for free where you can, get, you can learn how to give feedback to employees in a powerful and empowering way. The point is I'm asking you to be intentional and understanding you can plant seeds of growth or doubt as a leader. And it makes a tremendous impact on the daily meaning people draw from their work. That's the second marker of meaning. The third and final one that I have time to talk with you about today has to do with an increased sense of autonomy and influence. Raise your hand if you love to be micromanaged. When I do surveys, and I do a lot of them, the number one thing employees ultimately tell me is the most annoying thing their boss can do is micromanage, and yet there's a lot of that going on. Don't underestimate the power of granting autonomy to your individual employees and to your coworkers, wherever you can. The Journal of Personality and Psychology recently issued a report that said the number one factor that most correlates with whether or not someone can call themselves happy and fulfilled in life is whether or not they have autonomy, influence, and a sense of control in their life. It's such an important topic, we're gonna do a very brief double click. As consultant Mac McIntyre once pointed out, the process of Really, granting autonomy is similar to the process by which power flows through a light bulb. Let me explain. If you had 100 watts of power and you flowed it through a 10-watt light bulb, what would happen? If you had 10 watts of power and you flowed it through a 100-watt light bulb, what would happen? The light would flicker, never reaching its full illuminative capacity, right? Now, if you had 100 watts of empowerment and you floated through a 10-watt employee, what would happen? You'd fry their brains. But, and I think you see where I'm going with this, the real question is, if you have 10 watts of empowerment and you flow that through a 100-watt employee, what happens? They, too, flicker never reaching their full and illuminative capacity until, and the data supports me on this, they will actually become 10-watt employees, effectively quitting and staying. Or they'll just quit. Now, for whatever company you work at, raise your hand if you are proud to bring 10-watt employees into your organization. To raise your hand if you say, yes, where's the dimmest bulb around? I'm bringing that person into my organization. Of course you don't do that. We all bring in 100-watt employees. So the key is to think about them that way and let the empowerment wattage flow. It's incredibly important for creating a powerful culture from the ground up and creating meaning in the workplace. And you have to grant it intelligently because granting autonomy can be tricky. We can do things to really, really screw this up where it feels like you're effectively dumping, not effectively delegating. And I'll give you some tools to help you do that. Uh, I've had time to talk to you today about three markers of meaning. I hope you found them useful and powerful. If you want to check out more, you can uh, check out my book, Make It Matter. Uh, I'll be uh, signing books out there. Um, you can check it out at uh, scottmouse.com if you're interested. Much more importantly, tools to help you as leaders build a powerful culture from the ground up. Just go to my website, scottmouse.com forward slash free tools ocean. I put together a special tool just for today for any of you that are looking for ideas on what I've talked about today, how to grant autonomy intelligently, how to really give you know, autonomy in the most powerful way and help people find their purpose and other tools like that. You can download. Now, to close this out, I want to do uh, one last thing. I want to ask everybody to pull out their cell phone. Pull out your cell phone and turn on your flashlight. My daughter had to teach me how to do this, actually. When you get your flashlight on, hold it above your head. 
And if you don't know how to do that, don't worry. It took me a while to figure it out too. Now everybody kind of look around you. It's a pretty sweet visual. This galaxy of lights that you see, it represents on the personal side of the equation, all the people in your life who in some way, shape or form have loved you. Keep your heads up high. I'm asking you, in closing, to pick two points of light, just two. Two people in your universe that you know you should be spending more time investing in, but for whatever reason, you don't. They're too far away, you've grown distant, they annoy you occasionally, don't worry about that. Pick two people, and starting today, double down on the investment you make in them, because I can promise you folks, as a sort of pseudo-social scientist, I can tell you the investments we make in those that matter to us will matter in the end. The second thing I want you to do in closing, hold the lights up high, on the professional side of the equation, I now want you to be the brightest light, the absolute brightest light for somebody else out there in this universe. You be the one, the leader that imbued meaning into your job, into their job, so they could have greater happiness, and greater fulfillment, greater productivity. You can be that person. It starts with you. It starts today. Thank you.